on the demonstrations. The president tweeted this, the people of Iran are finally acting against the brutal and corrupt Iranian regime. All of the money that President Obama so foolishly gave them went into terrorism and into their pockets. The people have little food, big inflation, and no human rights. The U.S. is watching. Connor Powell, live from us with the latest information there on the ground. You're covering this from Jerusalem. Connor? Harris, the U.S. is watching, the world is watching, obviously, as well. President Trump offering strong support for those protesters who, for the sixth straight day, have defied their government, taken to the streets across the country. These protests began on Thursday in smaller, more rural uh, religious cities across the country, and they've spread uh, to Te Tehran and to a lot of other places. The main motivation appears to be the economic stagnation and widespread corruption that uh, is the real problem right now in Iran. And Seriously, it's uh, not the more urban Iranians living in Tehran that are leading this movement, but instead a traditional rural and conservative base of the Islamic regime that has really taken to the streets. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, today blamed outside agitators and enemies of Iran, but unlike in 2009 during the Green Revolution, which was led by reformist Iranian politicians, these protests so far appear to be a bottom-up and leaderless movement. It's a danger to the Iranian government because they don't know who to really point fingers at. Yes, they will continue pointing fingers at abroad, but they really can't put people under house arrest or, or blame like they did with the Green Movement. Yeah, and one of the things we're seeing, Harris, is that a lot of these protests, the overwhelmingly majority of them are under the age of 25. These are the young Iranians who may not have jobs, who have uh, an education, but have very dim prospects for the future. They don't have housing and things like that. They're probably still living with their parents. That is a big problem for the Iranian government, like we've seen in a lot of other Middle Eastern countries. These are the people with the least amount to lose. They don't have jobs, they don't have houses, they don't have property. That makes it very difficult and dangerous for this Iranian regime, who really uh, is in a tough bind here. They need to offer these protesters something, particularly because they come from the more rural conservative areas. This is the base of the Islamic regime there, Harris. Wow, you were giving us such good information about who these people are and why this government is now having to put its ear to the ground and actually listen to them. Uh, Connor Powell, thank you very much. There's a lot happening in the world, so we're going to scoop up on another region of the world and then go to Ambassador John Bolton. So keep watching. Now we'll do South Korea. Uh, South Korea says it's willing to talk to the North after Kim Jong-un declared his hope for a peaceful resolution with Seoul in his annual New Year's address. But in that very same speech, the North Korean dictator warned the United States the nuclear button is always on his desk and again claimed his missiles can strike anywhere inside the United States. Senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott is live in London watching this. Greg? Hi, Harris. Yeah, we heard a pretty threatening New Year's resolution coming from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in that New Year's address. He declared that he would spend the next year building up his arsenal of nuclear-tipped missiles with the capability of hitting the U.S. Most experts we talked to, in fact, do expect more testing in the coming year. But, as you noted, what is thought to be some kind of an overture to South Korea, he also offered to discuss sending athletes to next month's Winter Olympic Games in the South. Seoul responding with an offer to hold a meeting next Tuesday at a house at a building at the DMZ. It's called the Peace House, in fact. President Trump was circumspect in his tweet regarding this. Sanctions and other pressures are beginning to have a big impact on North Korea, he wrote. Soldiers are dangerously fleeing to South Korea. Rocket Man now wants to talk to South Korea for the first time. Perhaps that is good news, perhaps not. We will see. In fact, many analysts say that Pyongyang is simply trying to drive a wedge between the U.S. and its ally, South Korea. South Korea is asking, in fact, for a delay in joint military exercises with the U.S. until after the games. Seoul also said today, however, it does not just want to have better relations with the North. It does want to fix the nuclear problem in the North. Dangerous games indeed. Back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Greg Palcott, for giving us the facts on that. Meanwhile, Admiral Mike Mullen, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is also weighing in on U.S. tensions with North Korea. He sent a chilling message of his own. Let's watch it. We're actually closer 
in my view, to a nuclear war uh, with North Korea and in that region than we've ever been. And I, I just don't see uh, how, I don't see the opportunities to solve this diplomatically at this particular point. All right, let's bring in John Bolton, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Senior Fellow for the American Enterprise Institute and a Fox News contributor. Always great to see you. Happy New Year, Ambassador. Happy uh, New let's Year. Let's start in reverse order since we just wrapped up with North Korea, but I want to land on Iran uh, in just moments from now. But let's start with the North and something that you're saying is that uh, President Trump inherited a mess. How so? Well, after 25 years of uh, diplomacy and sanctions to try and stop North Korea from uh, getting deliverable nuclear weapons, uh, they're now obviously very close to it. And in the past year especially, uh, they've made strides that surprised many analysts that thought, thought they were further away from that capability. Now, I don't think they're there yet. I think they're very close, and I think that's why the president faces a very hard decision. He said in his September speech to the General Assembly that denuclearization is the only way forward forward uh, for North Korea. I think that's absolutely right. I think there is huh. zero chance that North Korea will give those uh, capabilities up voluntarily. So it leaves some pretty attractive options left. You know, I, I asked this question last hour on Outnumbered, and, and I know that unification might be something that North Korea would want because they want to rule it all on that peninsula. That's certainly not going to happen in the short hour or short uh, term. So what do they want that we can give them to get them to back away from this? I wouldn't give them air to breathe, frankly. Ooh. These these people have negotiated in bad faith uh, on the nuclear issue for 25 years. They negotiated in bad faith over the armistice beginning uh, in 1950. The regime is possessed of what Fred Clay, the uh, statesman, once called boundless mendacity. Uh, and this overture to South Korea, possibly sending a team to the Olympic Games, uh, is nothing but propaganda. It's, uh, it's music for the gullible and the naive. Unfortunately, there are some of them around around. Uh, North Korea is not going to be chit-chatted out of its nuclear capability. It is going to take a dramatic intervention by China, uh, which has the capability to do this in a way that uh, I think could achieve reunification of the peninsula the right way, which is South Korea <laughs> taking over the north. Uh, there are indications that's not going to happen. So if you want denuclearization, uh, you're very close to the, to the military option, even though nobody wants it. You know, no air to breathe. That sounds a lot like we would keep that military option in play. Ambassador, what does that look like? I mean, do we have the stomach to do that? I, I'm, I'm talking with military officials who say it would be bad, very bad. Yeah, how do you like dead Americans? I mean, that's the question. If you leave North Korea with this capability, it's not just what North Korea might do. It's to whom they would sell their capabilities, to Iran, to terrorist groups, to other rogue states. Huh. Uh, that's why I think the president's absolutely right. Denuclearization is the answer here. If we leave the North with a nuclear capability, we are at risk. Japan, South Korea, our other allies in the region are at risk. Uh, no, nobody wants to have to look at military force, but the notion that uh, we simply have to accept North Korea, and by the way, while we're on the subject, Iran with nuclear weapons, right. I do not agree with, period. Yeah, so, you know, Senator Graham was specifically talking about Iran when he said this, but I wrote this down. The president needs to talk about Iran and take the case to the people. Would you say real quickly before we move on from North Korea that he needs to do the same thing with North Korea or no? Yes, absolutely. I think the American people need to be... Uh, and what does he tell us? I think he says the threat we face is this bizarre, erratic regime with a capability to kill hundreds of thousands or millions of innocent Americans. We're not going to live under that kind of threat. Uh, and that's why we have to look at these measures. I think, uh, frankly, the more serious, the more credible the military threat against North Korea becomes, the greater the likelihood China will wake up and get off yeah. its posterior and do something serious. All right, let's move on. Uh, President Obama's Iran policies are now under fire in the wake of all the deadly protesting that's going on in Iran. And when I say deadly protesting, these are protesters, six out of nine over the weekend who died. Uh, and, and that's kind of doing battle, if you will, with the people on the ground for the government. Uh, what are your thoughts about, first of all, looking back and saying, yeah, and pointing to something under the Obama administration? Well, the Obama policy on Iran uh, from the get-go, essentially, was a policy of appeasement. 
Uh, and it was exemplified in his reaction to the demonstrations in the summer of 2009, not demonstrations that threatened the regime, but that complained about an obviously fixed and fraudulent elections. And the president's statement there started off by saying, uh, we don't want to do anything to interfere with the right of the Iranian people to pick their own government. When it was manifestly the case, they weren't picking their own government. It was being picked for them. But it was a symbol that he would do almost anything to get a nuclear deal. And in fact, by the summer of 2015, uh, he had basically done almost everything he could. The only regret the Ayatollahs in Iran have about that deal was they didn't ask for more because <laughs> they would have gotten it. So today, when you see the people rising up uh, for a lot of different reasons, it's a complex phenomenon. This is very different than 2009. These people are saying they want the regime overthrown. And I think the United States They're calling should for the support death. them. The deaths of some people among uh, the leadership in Iran, uh, which makes it very different than, you know, the revolution that we saw uh, years ago, uh, which, by the way, the United States, well, social media might have been a, a little different response to it had it been around the way it is now. But you didn't see the response of protests the way that you do around the country and around the world being organized in social media. So much so, Ambassador, that Iran is now saying, going to get rid of Instagram. You can't get on that. You can't get on other avenues, too. Well, here's, here's an example of some of the assistance that the United States could give to the opposition. Uh, not just financial and material assistance and not just uh, hortatory assistance from the president, uh, but also helping to give them alternative means of communication. Uh, and, you know, the, the social media in this country could step up to it as well uh, if they really wanted to help. I, I think there's a lot we can do here, and I don't think the United States should be guilty here of encouraging uh, this resistance and these demonstrations and then leaving them at the, t at the tender mercy of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and the besiege. We've done that before. It didn't uh, look well for the country. No. But I think, I think that uh, the president's been absolutely right in saying clearly to the world World, to the government of Iran, and most importantly to the people of Iran, we are with you, we are behind you, now he needs to back it up. All right, one more quick one, because I'm always looking for, for points of entryway. You're talking about helping them out with social media. But, you know, who takes kind of the accounting of a red line mentality here when you hear that the government of Iran is, is considering doing a muharaba? Putting into place uh, that law that they have that says you're working against the state punishable by death by protesting and, and seeking out some of the leaders, the organizers of this protest. Is that a red line for anybody, including us? And what would that well, look like? I agree with uh, part of what Connor Powell said uh, in his presentation a moment ago. I don't think that there are the kinds of leaders to this opposition as of now that the Iranian government can go after. I do think it reflects widespread, long-standing, and I mean decades-long discontent uh, with this government. And that makes it very hard to go after. And in fact, I'm mostly worried at this point not about the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei. I'm worried about the Revolutionary Guards. I think this regime is not just a theocratic autocracy. I think it's a military government, and, and they're the ones uh, that, uh, that we should be uh, concerned about and, and the, the steps they might take against the population, oh, wow. which, which is why to get the conscience of anybody we can in Iran, we want them to know that the United States uh, is watching and, and prepared to help the opposition if they're prepared to accept it. Well, we know he has tens of millions of followers, our president, in social media, and he says he is definitely watching the U.S.'s. Ambassador John Bolton, thank you for being on the first outnumbered overtime with me for 2018. Good to see Happy you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right. Well, a lot of you are feeling it. The Arctic blast that's hitting much of America, and now forecasters say the bitter cold is about to get worse. The latest from the Fox Extreme Weather Center. People die in this weather. It is bad. We'll tell you where it's hitting. Congress faces a high-stakes agenda in the new year, meaning, you know, this week. Can lawmakers reach a deal to avoid a government shutdown as they go back to work? And will Democrats get on board or continue to fight the president's agenda? A big meeting is planned for tomorrow with White House leaders. We'll talk with the House lawmaker next. Stay close. We want Democratic support for these measures. We wanted it on middle class tax cuts. We wanted it to improve the access and availability and affordability of health care for those 30 million Americans who don't have it.
it is on like Donkey Kong, as they say in my household. New year ahead, big time for lawmakers, busy calendar. A White House official says top congressional leaders from both political parties will meet tomorrow with White House Budget Director Mick Mulvaney and Legislative Affairs Director Mark Short. They plan to talk about a deal to avoid a government shutdown. They'll talk about immigration and other top issues, we are told. The White House is stepping up pressure on Democrats to get on board and work with them on their agenda. The specific agenda items, and we certainly hope we will get Democratic support on them, include the budget, getting some reasonable budget caps, uh, and maybe a budget deal for the next two years, certainly. It includes welfare reform, the dignity of work, also infrastructure. We need to rebuild our nation's roads and bridges, and, and certainly our air traffic control system. President Trump is also planning to host House Speaker Paul Ryan and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell at Camp David next weekend to talk about their priorities for 2018. Let's bring in Georgia Republican Drew Ferguson on the House Budget Committee. Great to see you, Congressman. Thanks for being here. Happy New Year to you. Uh, you know, Happy are, New Year to you, Falconer. Have we moved the ball at all on this talk of avoiding a government shutdown? I mean, we act like it's been all that long ago. It's only been a week or so, and January 19th is the deadline, and it's deja vu all over again. Yes, I think we have moved it, and, and the reason I say that is that you've seen Republicans come together in Congress to do the work necessary to keep it open. We would love to have Democratic support, but how, however, they have been very resistant to, to supporting the president, and therefore we've had to come together as a conference and, and, and do the heavy lifting, and we've done that. So I think we're in a strong position going forward. All right, but you need them. So what do you do to bring them on board? And do you have any good conversations? And you know what? It might be time to name names. Are there any Democrats who've even said the water is warm enough to jump in? Well, listen, we work we work hard every day that we're in session building relationships across the line. Um, we, we I agree with you. We do need we do need this to be as many of these issues to be bipartisan. And I think that we can get there. I think the unique thing that the Democrats are going to have to do is that they're going to have to stop their their opposition at all costs to to the president's policies that are actually helping Americans. We saw that with tax reform. We have a tax reform package that is actually going to make a real difference for middle class mm -hmm. Americans and, middle, and, and for business, and yet we did not see any Democratic support. It's, it's amazing to me that they won't support really good programs simply because of their opposition to the president, and that's something that's got to change. You know, inherent in your answer as you kind of enumerate all of those things is a call out to Democrats that there are some issues where you can work together. But what we've seen in recent years, the divide in Washington grow and grow and grow, is that both Republicans and Democrats tend to do this. They hunker down. Uh, you guys are in the majority bicamerally, but you need them on this issue to avoid the government shutdown. So how do you start to fix that? I mean, it's a bigger issue than even the shutdown. It's healing that divide in Washington. The last president said he tried and couldn't do it. Well, it's, it's not only up to the president, it's up to us as individual members of Congress to really develop relationships, to have conversations, to understand what's important to, say, a Democratic colleague in a, in a central California district versus a, a Republican like I am in a very conservative district in the South. Finding those things that we know that we can agree on, there are going to be some specific issues that we simply don't, but let's work together on those items that we can agree on. And I think that that's something that is happening. I, th I don't I think it's only incumbent upon the president. I think it's important that each right. individual member of Congress do that as well. You know, one thing that we watched this president do, and, and I know that Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer just rebuffed him the first time, but they finally got to the table on second invitation uh, to sit down with the president. But, you know, what this president has said is that he's willing to do a deal with whomever wants to make the deal. I mean, I'm, I know Republicans had to wake up to that because he had a DACA conversation with the Democrats a few months ago. So they have an opportunity there to, to come and do this. What do you want the president to, to do to kind of foster that relationship that you're talking about? Is there a place where he can step in? He's a deal maker. He knows how to get it done. Well, listen, I think the president has been very forward in, in saying exactly what you just said, Harris. I'm willing to make the deal on behalf of the American people. The president is more interested in, in rank and file Americans than he than he is necessarily a party. So I think that members of Congress on both sides of the aisle have got to come to the president with their ideas, with their with their with with options, 
and be willing to work with him. And we have seen that, and I have seen that firsthand. I've been in meetings with the president where he has looked at Republicans and Democrats and, and made the point that this is about the American people, it's not about the parties. Sure. So the president has taken a leadership role. It is time for it is time for members of Congress to step forward and and, and, and bring forward those ideas and commit to working for the American people. All right, so where do you start? Do you get a bipartisan deal on infrastructure and then build from there? No pun intended on the building. Listen, the, the first thing that we've got to do is we've, get, we've, we've got to get the budget cap deal. We've got to fund our military. We're having a really good conversation right now about, huh. about comprehensive immigration policy. If we don't fund our military and we don't secure our borders, then we've got real problems internally in, in, in this nation. So I think that those things are very, very important. Infrastructure is a huge priority of the president. Yeah. It's a huge priority of every single American. Making sure that we've got the, the transportation needs that we need. Um, taken care of, the maintenance side of things. But here's another important thing to realize. Our economy is changing. It's evolving. And there's a real need for broadband infrastructure, particularly in rural and rural parts of the nation like I represent. Yeah. And what, what, asking the question, what is the federal government's role in that? And how can we make sure that that critical infrastructure is available so that, so that families in, in, in rural parts of America have an opportunity to, to succeed in this new economy? Yeah, you know what? I, I respect so much about what you're saying, because when you start to build those jobs out, you may have a situation where people can do things remotely in a satellite fashion but you've got to have broadband. You've got to be able to connect uh, with everybody around the globe and, and in our country in order to take advantage of those jobs that are coming down the pike. You said something I haven't heard anybody else say, and I like the way you put it. You said we're having a good conversation about comprehensive immigration. That means you're talking about it and you're selling it in a positive way. Maybe everybody will jump on board and, and join you with that because uh, it's got to be talked about. Great to see you from the great I, I, I state of Tennessee. All right. Well, listen, we're, it's, we're down here in the great state of Georgia, and I just want to give a shout out to the Georgia Bulldogs. Um, they played a really good game last night against the Oklahoma Sooners, and it uh, looks like All we're right. going to be in the national championship yes, game did. in Atlanta. Okay. In about a week or so. Good luck with that, and thank you. Arctic you, temperatures are putting much of the United States into a deep freeze. We know that, including all of us here in the New York City area. We're really up and down the seaboard here. When will we thaw out? A forecast straight ahead. Senator Al Franken resigning today amid numerous allegations of sexual misconduct. Is this a sign that things are finally changing for the better on Capitol Hill? We will talk with one lawmaker who's doing everything she can to make sure it does. Stay close. Here's my promise to you. I may be leaving the Senate, but I'm not giving up my voice. <laughs> The situation is changing so quickly, we want to check in on the dangerous winter weather that's gripping much of the nation. Uh, and those temperatures are going to get even colder. Uh, it could get colder by the end of the week and into the weekend, particularly in certain areas of the country where they've already seen hardship uh, over this issue. You, you've got people that are really struggling. Fox News meteorologist Adam Klotz is live in the Extreme Weather Center. So this goes beyond just it's a little bitter cold out there. I know I was reading in some areas where people are having to shelter in. It's bad. Yeah, it is. It's really bad and it's really widespread. Sometimes you get these cold snaps that are isolated. This isn't the case. The current temperatures across the country, obviously there's spots where it's colder. That's running up into the northern plains in the Midwest right now. But below freezing temperatures, below 32 degrees, stretching down into Texas where it's still 26 degrees in Dallas, just breaking that in San Antonio, 33 degrees also in New Orleans. This is a deep freeze across much of the eastern half of the country. You add in the wind, and that's when you start to talk about wind chill, what it feels like when you step outside, and there's a lot of folks that are down into the negatives. Feels like negative 15 degrees in Chicago. Feels like negative 8 degrees in Minneapolis. It's not warming up a whole lot in the next couple of days. When you get something like this, that's when you start to see some of these wind chill watches and advisories. They've been popping up every single night. Some of them linger into the day, and we're continuing to see that right now. The temperatures, unfortunately, not warming up a whole lot the next couple of days. This is now taking you into tomorrow's high temperature. With the wind chill, it'll feel colder, but these are actual highs across the country, and you see plenty of spots down into the teens, in some cases down into single digits. Unfortunately, it's not retreating. I run you into Thursday, and you're seeing this deep cold air settle more and more into the Midwest, where it's back to 12 degrees in Chicago. It's just going to stay cold, and on top of that, Harris, low-pressure system running up the coast. 
If this interacts and there's still a little bit of indecision on this, we could be talking about some big snow by the end of the week going into the weekend also. So wow. lots to pay attention to in the weather world. You know, Adam, real quickly before I let you go, I mean, I, when in terms of the weather, we typically look at that kind of a local situation. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this. Is this a polar vortex situation that's now affecting the entire country and what that means for this winter in general as you look ahead? You know, this is actually supposed to to be a mild winter just because of the atmospheric conditions. Uh, but yeah, we're talking about a widespread freeze. It, Harris, it wouldn't be impossible to see some snow in North Florida later this week. So this is very unusual uh, and wow. cold everywhere. Yep. Wow. That's big news. Adam yep. Potts, thank you very much. That affects growers, farmers. Wow. We'll come back as the news warrants. Here's my promise to you. I may be leaving the Senate, but I'm not giving up my voice. We still have a lot of work to do. I feel hopeful for the future of our country. That was Democrat Senator Al Franken from Minnesota just a few days ago. He's expected to officially resign from the Senate today after a number of women accused him of sexual harassment and misconduct. He's just one of several lawmakers forced to step down or not seek re-election over similar accusations. So. Does this show that things are finally changing on Capitol Hill, moving in the right direction? Let's check in with somebody who is leading the charge among a bipartisan group of women. Virginia Congresswoman Barbara Comstock sponsored legislation requiring all lawmakers and their staff to undergo sexual harassment training. And, Congresswoman, you are working on another bill that would make it easier to report misconduct. Uh, tell me where you are on this and what kind of, and I know we talk a lot about bipartisan, but what about like across gender lines, too, because you didn't have a yes. lot of men with you when you and I talked a few weeks ago. Catch yeah, me actually, up. We do have, um, this is uh, bipartisan and it is uh, both men and women. Our chairman on the House Administration Committee, Chairman Harper, and our ranking member, who is male, and then Jackie Spear from California, a Democrat, and Bradley Byrne, who's a Republican, who is a labor lawyer expert and who worked on a lot of these issues. Um, we are all working together, the five of us, to uh, get a bill that will you know, provide a victim's advocate, really protect victims of sexual harassment, certainly have zero tolerance, the education that you talked about. We want to make sure that there's no taxpayer funding going to any type of settlement and that the members would have to take care of that themselves if there is any such uh, case. And we also, there's legislation that's already been introduced that I support that would also disclose all the previous settlements from the past that we right. still don't know about because the law does not allow us to find that out right now. But I think that should be made public and certainly in the future, um, our legislation will also make sure that happens. So too. that's interesting. So you pe technically would have to change the law to even find out what we don't know in that what's being called a shush fund. I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, you know what's, I, I'm reading some of the bullet points of what you've put together, and one thing that really stands out to me is it deals with that money issue. Because taxpayers were mad, you know. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know. And it, so members will now be personally accountable when settling claims. Exactly. That's going to yeah. be potentially a powder keg because then they have to run on that. Their voters are going to know, and it's coming out of their own pocket. Well, exactly. And I think, you know, what the American people have seen is they've seen people in Hollywood. They've seen people on all of our networks now who've had to resign, you know, very prominent people um, here and pretty much every other network in the news industry and, you know, really across all industries. So they're now seeing that in Congress, too, that people are being held accountable. And on the financial end, we think that's important also. I should mention that the fund that you mentioned, a, a lot of those cases are most of them actually aren't sexual harassment. Yes, Many of true. them are things like for the Capitol Police, some discrimination or the Office as of the well. Architect, because there's a lot of dangerous jobs, you know, at the Capitol, sure. obviously, with the Capitol Police. So we want them to be able to be protected if they are injured in the line of duty. But when you're talking about sexual harassment, we do feel it's very important that the members will be personally responsible for that. So we may have to have some type of insurance rider that we carry ourselves. But the wow. important thing is the taxpayers shouldn't um, be paying for that and there should be full disclosure and information about it but we're also this has been very nonpartisan and you know as as i mentioned the group of us who are working on it have really come to so much agreement on this because the victims are not it's nonpartisan you know democrat and oh, republican absolutely. women and it's largely women who've been victims although there can be men in these cases so we want to make sure we do it on this nonpartisan basis 
and really look at it from how can we improve the workplace, make it a safe workplace for everybody, and make sure that um, we aren't going to see these type of cases again in the future. But if we do, they are swiftly dealt with. Yeah, and I guess the next time we talk, I want to ask you about clawback, because the taxpayers might want some of that settlement money back and let these people yes. carry it on their own. Uh, yeah, well, yes, Congresswoman, we want to see that too. <laughs> Congresswoman Comstock, you are moving expeditiously on this issue. You mentioned all of the men and the women who are working with you. We appreciate you bringing in the news on this point. We'll bring you back. Thank you. Thank you. What should be the president's response to the developments unfolding in Iran, where a deadly crackdown on anti-government protests is in full swing? Why now may be the time for the president to send a clear message to the world's bad actors once and for all. Our power panel debates. Okay, keep watching this. Uh, we are keeping an eye on the United Nations. We expect Ambassador Nikki Haley to take reporters' questions at any moment. She will most likely address the deadly protesting in Iran. That's what we're being told. Meanwhile, Senator Lindsey Graham is calling on President Trump to lay out his strategy for Iran, for the nation to see, to talk directly to the American people, saying it would send a message to North Korea even that the U.S. means business. The South Carolina Republican also says the president should withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal and give a national address explaining the approach. He added this tweeting is not enough. Watch. It's not enough to watch. President Trump is tweeting uh, very sympathetically to the Iranian people. But you just can't tweet here. You have to lay out a plan. And if I were President Trump, I'd lay out a plan as to how I would engage the regime. I would tell the Europeans and the Congress and the world that America is going to withdraw from this agreement unless it's a better deal. And I'd lay out what a be better deal would look like. And I would stand with the Iranian people the entire time. So we had planned to talk about this anyway. Now it's breaking news because we know as soon as Ambassador Nikki Haley pops up, we'll take her live. A political analyst for Rasmussen Reports, Amy Holmes, is here. And back from our hour on Outnumbered, Fox News contributor, radio talk show host, Richard Fowler. Amy, I want to go to you first. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that Nikki Haley will break it real. Like, yes. <laughs> whatever she's about to say, whatever mm -hmm. question she's going to answer uh, about Iran or whatever it is, she and the president are in concert on this. Your take? Yes, uh, that's my take as well. And as far as uh, Senator Graham said, talking about the president needing to lay out an Iran strategy, Strategy, I agree with him that tweeting is not enough and that the president needs to also convey material and moral support for the Iranian people. But I tell our viewers they can also put down their New York Times, which just a uh -oh. couple months ago, Harris, was reporting very confidently that Trump's bellicosity, his belligerence, was driving the Iranian people into the arms of the regime. Well, now we see that that's not true. What is going to be the consequences of this uprising? Well, it looks like it's either revolution massacre possibly or stalemate and I think the US position on this can influence those results. Richard? I, I tend to agree with that. I think the, the, the interesting thing here, and we talked about this on the couch a couple, in the last hour, is how the president reacted. This will be the beginning of what will be the Trump doctrine, right? How we deal with foreign countries and how we deal with rogue, rogue states. But beyond Don't we that... I think we already know that it's put America first or am I right, but it, it, on that? Well, if it is put America first, then do we in, are we interventionists? Do we get involved? Do we set our military troops to support these protests? Protesters. These are all the big questions that we will answer, uh, that the president will have to answer, which is why Lindsey Graham is calling for him to lay out a strategy and just not tweet, because it's more than that. Are we going to support these protesters and how will we so, support them? One of the things that Ambassador Bolton told me just a few minutes ago when he was live on the program, Amy, is that our situation of supporting this revolution mm -hmm. uh, or resistance, whatever you want to call right. it, uh, can be something as simple and as important as helping them to organize on social media. You know, this is a government that is strangling them Absolutely. in terms of being able to reach out to the rest of the world. We may have some capabilities that can help them out. Absolutely. And one of the things that happened was Iran shut down a social media app called Telegram that was right. developed by a Russian. And they went to that Russian to ask him for help in doing that. And he did. So where the United States can step in is to help, uh, to help these forces, resistance forces communicate. But I really want to go back to this notion that the world world is watching. And the big question is, will the Revolutionary Guard, will they stand down or will they fire on the Iranian people? At this point, we don't know. But if we, if, if we are watching, they may be a little bit more hesitant to do that. So you're echoing, again, what Ambassador Bolton said. And it would be one of the questions that I would want to ask Amb Ambassador Nikki Haley about. You know, this isn't just the Ayatollahs. 
Right. This this is that uh, that revolutionary guard, which makes it military, which then brings into what you're saying. Then we need to let the world know where we stand as well. In right. That, that what are the consequences? And, and I think the consequences are key. And then beyond that, we have to also remember that we have two situations in that region where if we once we engage, if we break it, we bought it. We broke Iraq, we bought it. We broke Afghanistan, we bought it. And so once we begin to put our military in Iran, but Iran is we different, create though. A, Iran is different because Iran situation. through created, the deal that President Obama made. And again, we need to know what those sides deals look like right. in that deal. But what he said was that, well, you know, companies can start to do business with Iran. So their, their economy is very different than from these other no, countries. No, abso absolutely. I think about. the economy is different. And I think the reason, the reason why I sort of, where I differ apart from Lindsey Graham is that I think you have to right. keep the Iran. Ira okay, here she comes. Yeah, uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley then walking up to the microphone that sits outside uh, the assembly room there. Let's watch and listen together. Happy New Year. It's great to see everyone again. Happy 2018. We know it's going to be a great year. But what we wanted to do was just um, talk about the fact that obviously 2017 was a very active year here at the UN. And we expect a lot of activity this year as well. We're starting off fast. And I want to touch on a few topics that are now front and center facing the world. In these first days of 2018, nowhere is the urgency of peace, security, and freedom being more tested than in Iran. By the thousands, Iranian citizens are taking to the streets to protest the oppression of their own government. It takes great bravery for the Iranian people to use the power of their voice against their government especially when their government has a long history of murdering its own people who dare to speak the truth. So we applaud the tremendous courage of the Iranian people. The government of Iran is actively attempting to stop social media and other forms of communication that allow their citizens' voices to be heard. So we want to help amplify the voices of the Iranian people. Here are some of the messages that they're chanting today. All these brigades have come out to the streets. They've come out against the leader. Political prisoners must be freed. Independence, freedom, Iranian Republic. Neither Gaza nor Lebanon, my life only for Iran. Let go of Syria, think of us. We will die, but we'll take Iran back. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We're all together. And in reference to the Supreme Leader, quote, feel some shame. Let go of the country. Those are not my words. Those are not the words of the United States. Those are the words of the brave people of Iran. Now the Iranian dictatorship is trying to do what it always does, which is to say that the protests were designed by Iran's enemies. We all know that's complete nonsense. The demonstrations are completely spontaneous. They are virtually in every city in Iran. This is the precise picture of a long oppressed people rising up against their dictators. The international community has a role to play on this. The freedoms that are enshrined in the United Nations Charter are under, are under attack in Iran. Dozens have already been killed. Hundreds have been arrested. If the Iranian dictatorship's history is any guide, we can expect more outrageous abuses in the days to come. The UN must speak out. In the days ahead, we will be calling for an emergency session, both here in New York and at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. We must not be silent. The people of Iran are crying out for freedom. All freedom-loving people must stand with their cause. The international community made the mistake of failing to do that in 2009. We must not make that mistake again. On a second matter, the crisis in North Korea will continue to have our attention in 2018. We finished December with our third strong sanctions resolution of last year. That was a great achievement, but there is more to do to ensure full implementation of the Security Council resolutions. As we hear reports that North Korea might be preparing for another missile test. I hope that does not happen. But if it does, we must bring even more measures to bear on the North Korean regime.
The civilized world must remain united and vigilant against the rogue state's development of a nuclear arsenal. We will never accept a nuclear North Korea. There's one more item I want to mention. You have all heard that President Trump's comments um, made about Pakistan. The administration is withholding $255 million in assistance to Pakistan. There are clear reasons for this. Pakistan has played a double game for years. They work with us at times, and they also harbor the terrorists that attack our troops in Afghanistan. That game is not acceptable to this administration. We expect far more cooperation from Pakistan in the fight against terrorism. The President is willing to go to great lengths to stop all funding from Pakistan as they continue to harbor and support terrorism. And that brings me to my final point. The Pakistan aid issue is not connected to the vote we had with Jerusalem. It is entirely connected to Pakistan's harboring of terrorists. However, as I said in December, we won't forget the Jerusalem vote. To that end, tomorrow night we are having a reception for the countries who chose not to oppose the U.S. position. This is a great sign of U.S. friendship and I look forward to tomorrow evening. We hope to see more of this in 2018. The United States is asked to do a huge amount around the world and we're happy to do that, but we expect to be treated respectfully in return. I wish all of you a good 2018 and I'll take a couple of questions. Thank you, Ambassador. What do you, which UN body in New York do you want to handle Iran and to do what? Well, I think right now we're going to have conversations with the Security Council and see what we need to do to have an emergency session. One way or the other, we will have a meeting on what is happening in Iran with the protests and their fight for freedom. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador. Margaret Bashir with Voice of America. Um, Ambassador, in light of the protests, is there any unilateral action the United States plans to take against Iran? And uh, also, uh, here at the Security Council, do you plan to hold Iran accountable on another front, uh, perhaps through the, the uh, Yemen Sanctions Committee for the uh, missiles that they fired into Saudi Arabia? You had that presentation last month. Right. There's no unilateral plans at this time um, that have come from the administration. What I can tell you is we are absolutely going to move forward on the missiles. You will see us look at um, Resolution 2231 carefully and see what needs to be changed so that we can put a stop to the Iran Iranian testing of ballistic missiles. Yes. Uh, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. Uh, will the U.S. maintain its present level of funding of the U.N. Relief Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in light of the General Assembly of Jerusalem Resolution pushed by the Palestinians and the Palestinian U.N. representatives threat to unleash, quote, all the weapons we have in the U.N.? Close. I think the President um, has basically said that he doesn't want to give any additional funding um, or stop funding until the Palestinians are agreeing to come back to the negotiation table. And what we saw with the resolution um, was not helpful to the situation. We're trying to move for a peace process, but if that doesn't happen, the President's not going to continue to fund that situation. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam uh, Ambassador. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayam from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. Now, you're so strong when it comes to the freedom and dignity of the Iranian people, but you have different meaning of freedom and dignity when it comes to the Palestinian people who've been, who been brutalized for over 50 years of occupation. The second question related to it, what make, made you believe that you are on the right side of history when you stood alone in the Security Council against 14 members of the Security and in the GA, 128 countries, you only found countries like Palau and Nauru next to you. What made you believe that you are on the right side of history. Thank well, you very much. I stood proudly, even if I was the only hand in the Security Council, to fight for the will of the people of the United States. They wanted to see the, the embassy moved to Jerusalem, and we followed through with that. We very much still want to have a peace process. Nothing changes with that. The Palestinians now have to show their will that they want to come to the table. As of now, they're not coming to the table, but they ask for aid. We're not giving the aid. We're going to make sure that they come to the table, and we want to move forward with the peace process. One last question. Yes. 
Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Fuji TV, can I ask you regarding uh, North Korea? Uh, as you heard uh, reports about uh, South Korea proposing talks with North Korea, can you give us your reaction to that? And if, about this uh, talks, does it affect any of your policies putting pressure on North Korea? We won't take any of the talks seriously if they don't do something to ban all nuclear weapons in North Korea. We consider this to be a very reckless regime. We don't think we need a Band-Aid and we don't think we need to smile and take a picture. We think that we need to have them stop nuclear weapons and they need to stop it now. So North Korea can talk with anyone they want, but the U.S. is not going to recognize it or acknowledge it until they agree to ban the nuclear weapons that they have. Thank you very much. All right, not known for mincing words at all. Our ambassador at the United Nations is Nikki Haley. And Amy Holmes, I heard you in the background saying this is exactly what the Iranian people want to hear. Why do you say that? Well, you heard Nikki Haley reporting, and I read it earlier today, that the Iranian people are even holding up slogans saying, my life is not for the West Bank. It's not for Lebanon. It's for Iran. And that they don't want to be used as pawns in that conflict for the Iranian government to deflect from its own mistreatment of the Iranian citizens. But I want to get back to some earlier points that Richard was making. That military intervention is not necessarily a, an option for the United States, certainly not a top option, but that there are soft diplomatic things we can do. And also, as you heard Nikki Haley sort of sending out, a, I think, a warning shot over the bow, we can also withhold money. And we're withholding yeah. $250 million from Pakistan, $275 All right, million let, from the Let UN. me jump in there, though, because she made it very clear. She said that Pakistan aid that's being withheld, and mm -hmm. she said she's confirming that. She's like, if you've heard it, it's true. Uh, the stance there is not about Israel or our choice to recognize Jerusalem as the proper capital and move our, our uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to there. She says it's about Pakistan harboring terrorists. And who do we know that they harbored? Osama bin Laden. I think that's a very. I think that's one of that's to me. That's the breaking news out of this press conference because outside of uh, North Korea, the other most likely scenario of nuclear war is the India-Pakistan border, the Kashmir region, where the United Nations yeah. has a peacekeeping operation there. Because neither India or Pakistan has both their weapons are on hair trigger alert and they're pointed at each other because of the right. warring in this region. So, and what all presidents had to do previously is sort of keep aid on both sides to sort of stop this pending nuclear war between these two warring between these two warring countries because they're still we had to pay them not to fight exactly just right. say it <laughs> we did because they're still at war yeah. uh, and so the fact that we're withholding funds really sort of to me was a whoa so That's what does big. that mean to you i mean i think that means that there i, I I'm, my question is is what happened at the state department that said we're going to withhold funds and how are we now going to Dip diplomatically keep right, right. peace it's, between these Amy? two states and the Kashmir region. It's not what happened at the State Department. It's what happened at 1600 Pennsylvania.